Thank you. How, hi, everyone. My son is a freshman here at Northeastern. So I want to talk to you about something that my generation continues to break, hoping that his generation will fix. But before I start, how many of you can estimate their carbon footprint? Please raise your hand. No one. 2017 was the hottest year on record. So was 2016 and 2015 before it. Climate change may be the biggest problem that humanity ever faced. So why is it that no one can estimate their carbon footprint? I ran into this problem about 10 years ago. I was the CEO of a solar energy company called Heliofocus. And we were, we were building large solar concentrators to replace some of the coal in conventional power plants with solar energy. This is our plant in Inner Mongolia, China. Each concentrator is about the size of a six-story building. It tracks the sun with accuracy of about one degree, and it heats air to the temperature of a coal-fired power plant. It's a remarkable engineering achievement. But our green solution also had a dark side. Our, each concentrator contains about 60 tons of steel. The steel was produced in a province called Hebai, and it was processed using coal. So effectively, we were using coal to build our concentrators and then use our concentrators to replace coal. And the question is, what is our carbon footprint? I had a team of world-class engineers in the company. So I've asked my engineers to estimate our carbon footprint. Surprisingly, it was a very difficult problem, which they couldn't solve. So I start to spend my time asking my investors, suppliers, customers, colleagues, life cycle researchers, even competitors, how to estimate our carbon footprint. Everybody thought that it's a very important question, but nobody had a good answer. So I left the company and spent the following few years on this particular subject. How can we make carbon footprint simpler and more accurate? I started this journey by talking about carbon footprinting in universities. I typically start my presentation by asking faculty and students to estimate their carbon footprint, just like I've asked you. Here are the results of some of the survey here in the Boston area. Here at Northeastern, out of 81 people, only one could estimate his carbon footprint. He's a life cycle researcher, and he does it for a living. All the rest could not. At MIT, I was a little luckier because some students in the audience were developing a carbon footprinting app, but all the rest could not. Overall, according to this survey, only 2% of faculty and students in leading US universities can estimate their carbon footprint. We used to be worried about illiteracy. Now, innumeracy is defined as the inability to understand numbers. Now we have 98% carbon in numeracy in leading US universities, and nobody pays attention. My son is growing into a, climate, a changing climate, and nobody is teaching him to think quantitatively about his impact. Let's take this question of carbon in numeracy a step further. Let's ask ourselves, if we ask people to estimate the simplest carbon footprint, what will be the estimation error? How good are we? The simplest carbon footprint turns out to be a gallon of gasoline. Because every year, the average American spends about two hours just fueling our cars. It's a physical experience. Then we step on the gas ourselves and emit carbon, emit CO2. It is us. It's not a remote power plant. So this is the most intuitive carbon emission. While we fuel our cars, the price, we have nothing better to do, just look at the price. This is why we know the price with fractions of cents. But how well do we know the carbon footprint? What is the carbon footprint of a gallon of gasoline or liter outside of the US? The carbon footprint of a gallon of gasoline is about nine kilograms of CO2 or 20 pounds. If there's one number that you may want to remember after this talk, is this one. 20 pounds or nine kilograms of CO2 per gallon of gasoline. Every time that you fuel your car with a gallon of gasoline, you privately emit about 20 pounds of CO2. 
This number will be, will be very useful in your estimations. Together with uh, Amir Greenstein from here at Northeastern and a few other colleagues, we've asked 1,200 people to estimate the carbon footprint of a gallon of gasoline, the simplest carbon footprint. This is a logarithmic plot of the results. Most people were wrong by a factor of 100 or more. All these people were wrong by a factor of 10,000. They were thinking that they were emitting about the weight of this coin, about one gram, where actually they were emitting about the weight of this weight, 20 pounds or 9 kilograms of CO2. Four orders of magnitude estimation error. This is how bad we are. Think about stepping into a Starbucks and thinking that a cup of coffee will cost $30,000. Our carbon innumeracy has an immediate toll. Because without metrics, we cannot think critically. We cannot hold organizations accountable. A few months ago, Apple launched the iPhone 8. The iPhone 8 was launched as a low carbon footprint phone. The carbon footprint of the iPhone 8 is 57 kilograms of CO2. Now that you know that the carbon footprint of a gallon of gasoline is about 9 kilograms of CO2, you know that a gallon of gasoline is about, that the iPhone is about six gallons of gasoline, or six times this weight. You can start thinking quantitatively. But why is the iPhone 8 a low carbon footprint phone? Low relative to what? Maybe relative to previous generation iPhones. Apple made a progress, and it's proud of it. Previous generation iPhones had exactly the same carbon footprint. The iPhone 6 and the iPhone 7 had the same carbon footprint maybe even a little lower. The problem is not the absence of data. We're surrounded by data. The problem is our inability to interpret the data. Now, this issue is much bigger than your phone. Today, humanity emits about 50 billion tons of CO2 each year. In order to contain global warming to less than 2 degrees C above pre-industrial levels, we need to reduce our emissions by 40% by 2030 and by 80% by 2050. Think about it, 80% reduction while maintaining economic growth. To do that, all countries in the world signed the Paris Agreement. The US might want to become an exception. In addition, 25 cities and states, 2,500 cities and states, and more than 2,100 companies signed the agreement. There's one thing that they have in common. They are all led by people that were never taught to think quantitatively about carbon. As a result, they're trying to reduce a number that they don't know how to count. 50 billion tons is a huge number. Let's make it more manageable. Let's focus on one household, mine. The carbon footprint of my household is 50 tons of CO2 per year. So out of humanity's 50 billion tons, I own about 50 tons. So let's make my personal private 50 tons part of the Paris Agreement. So I also signed the agreement. Now we have 196 countries, 2,500 cities and states, more than 2,100 companies, and one person, one individual. This is the agreement that I've signed. You can sign the same agreement. It says that during 20. 18, I need to come up with a carbon reduction plan. I signed it in an email because the United Nations platform does not accept individuals. Now I am committed to the same kind of reduction plan as all other organizations that signed the Paris Agreement. But I want to be different. I want to start from the basics and first teach myself how to count. First deal with my carbon innumeracy. Professor Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize in Economics for his work on decision-making and uncertainty. A few years ago, I went to speak to Professor Kahneman and asked him, what does it take to improve our carbon numeracy? What does it take to make carbon footprint simple and more accurate? His answer was eye-opening with its simplicity. In order to make a metric successful, you need essentially two things, 
consistency and practice. You need consistency because the same question needs to have the same answer all the time. And then you need to practice. Think about all the metrics in your life. If you're on a diet, then calories are intuitive. They are more or less the same, consistent, and then you practice it. And it is not a question of complexity. For example, the temperature that we use every day to decide how to get, how to, uh, what clothes to wear outside is a very complex measure. It measures the average molecular kinetic energy. And actually, we don't feel temperature, we feel heat loss. But all this doesn't matter as long as it is consistent and we practice it. The problem with carbon footprint is that it is often inconsistent. And even when it is consistent, like a gallon of gasoline, we hardly ever practice. So let's take Kahneman's insight and see how it helps us improve my carbon numeracy and meet our Paris goals. And to do that, let's focus on one simple example, just one project. So I went online and looked for the best project that I can implement. The project that came up most often is switching my car to an electric car. So let it, let's see, what is the carbon footprint of an electric car? I can be qualitative and call the electric car green, but obviously I know that this is not true because the electric car uses electricity, the electricity comes from the grid, the grid is fed by power plants, and those power plants are carbon intensive. So let me demonstrate how to be more quantitative. And in order to do that, let's define a simple metric, miles per gallon. But the electric car doesn't use gallon, it uses electricity. But now we can define a gallon as 20 pounds of, of CO2, or 9 kilograms. How many miles can I drive per 20 pounds of CO2? If I take all the power plants in the United States and average them, I find that on average, the electric car doesn't have any advantage over the hybrid car. They are more or less the same. On average, it's the same. These kind of estimations are valuable because it allows me to think quantitatively. It allows me to practice. And it gives me the right order of magnitude. I believe that every student in the 21st century should learn how to do these simple estimations. But estimations are not enough. Reality is more nuanced. The electric car can be much better than the hybrid car if we control where our electricity comes from. To see this, let's make an experiment. Let's assume that I park my electric car here in this room, and I charge it in this room right now. What will be the carbon footprint? In this room right now, I might be getting my electricity from a hydroelectric power plant in Quebec or from a coal-fired power plant in Connecticut. The problem is that I don't know which is which because when the electrons move on the grid, they don't carry an ID card. They're all the same. They don't tell me where they come from. Because of this, if you would ask different experts for the carbon footprint of an electric car charged here and now, you may get different answers, which violates our consistency goal. A few years ago, I made a modest contribution to this problem. I led a group of data scientists, and we've mapped the entire North America electrical grid. And we've analyzed the carbon footprint at each point. The data is free online. So developers can use this information to develop apps that allow everyone to see where to charge their electric car and other uses. If you take this information and you would charge your electric car at Northeastern University on a Sunday afternoon, you will find that the efficiency is about double the efficiency of a hybrid car once you control your electricity. But now, what happens if I charge my electric car with my solar power from Inner Mongolia, China? After some research, I found that the carbon intensity of my solar collector is about 10 times better than the average grid, similar to other solar panels. So if I charge my electric car with solar panels, my miles per gallon or my efficiency are about 10 times better. It is not renewable, it is not carbon neutral, it is not zero emissions. We can forget those adjectives. We can use numbers, but it is 10 times better than all alternatives. 
this is the value of practicing simple numbers that are consistent. Now let me summarize. Many people and organizations would like to reduce their carbon footprint. One thing that they have in common, they don't know how to count the very number that they want to reduce. The fundamental reason is that carbon footprint is often inconsistent and we hardly ever practice. But we can change that. Here are three simple steps that we can use for the beginning. For example, my son here at Northeastern found out that every two miles that he rides with his bike, he saves about a pound of CO2. You can do the numbers. All you need to remember is 20 pounds or 9 kilograms per gallon. Second, imagine what will happen if we leave this room today with 100 more signatures on the Paris Agreement, and then millions more signatures. We will be able to hold each other, ourselves, our communities, our organizations, our leaders accountable. And the third is the hardest. We need to make a collective decision to get rid of our carbon innumeracy. Our carbon innumeracy has been hugely convenient. It allowed everyone to become green. There was only one exception, the planet. Thank you very much. <laughs>